Hey, thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Art Kalick. Uh, I was uh, one of the irresponsible uh, developers of this project. Um, and uh, it occurred to me uh, that this is a little bit of computer history uh, that uh, has gone maybe uh, by the wayside. So I'm just trying to keep it fresh. Uh, it's uh, something there. So I'm going to introduce an ad that ran for the service in 1984, as you can see. And... Not. The shopping trip. Key facts let you turn information into action. Key facts gives you shopping, banking, tickets, reservations, stock quotes, and much more. Get into action, Chicago. Call 1 800 4 Keyfax for a free demonstration at a store near you. So that um, ran in uh, 1984. Um, on here, the service more or less went out of business a bit there, but let me start up uh, my slide sequence here. Um, and here you can see this is my uh, business card back then. I think you'd notice that there is no email. You can't imagine a business card without email these days, but geez. I, uh, and it didn't even have a fax. So I was one of the development managers and we could uh, do this. And this whole presentation is would not be possible without the internet now for both the archives and just com uh, com commanding things. So we just showed you what's on TV in 1984. Uh, that's uh, one of the ads. Here we have a vintage uh, terminal, and we can later bring up, we have, I met a gentleman, Kevin, here, who, uh, from a different end of the business, more of the end consumer, happened to have an identical terminal, slightly rebranded for business purposes. So that's the nice thing in one of these computer fairs, is how well serendipity happens. On my way out yesterday, I saw his posting on the bulletin board and went, but wait. <laughs> there's more. So we'll have a chance to uh, run with Kevin. And these are the boxes I had. I have a unit, had a unit uh, in a similar box that I donated to the Computer History Museum. This I considered was a prototype. Uh, there may have been 100, 200 of these custom made. Certainly not millions of them like Atari, Apple IIs, and things like this. So it is a uh, oddity, uh, I want a, a, a onesie, not a onesie, but a fusies. Okay, and here's the other side, and you can see what we were trying to do. This is 1984, but this is the microcosm of what I do today on the internet. Okay, so 40 years ago, I wanted to bank. I had to go bitch at my bank the other day because they locked me out. I do shopping, God knows, I live with Amazon. I mean, uh, wouldn't do that. Information, that's exactly what's going on. Reserve, email uh, of various forms, and special. We did games, uh, it's all over that. We had a text, not a text, a slightly graphics-based game we called Stranded on Titan, which was one of your uh, uh, stranded in a maze of asteroid uh, type, uh, basically text-based uh, game. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what it was, it was a custom set-top box. It connected uh, to the service via a modem, 1,200-baud modem. It had an IR uh, detached keyboard. Um, it ran... Uh, uh, Built-in TV conversions. I know my original Apple II, I had to have all kinds of strange things to convert it into my TV. That was built in, plugged and played. Uh, and it had, in its day, uh, uh, it was designed in the late, uh, you know, say, 82 time frame. 
uh, based on an 8086 processor for more power uh, with the 16-bit bus and a little more power because some of the graphics took some doing uh, on here. And locally, we tested it, helped the engineers. It was designed in Canada, but we helped the engineers there. The other thing I didn't focus on my business card was this, all this development and business offices were just uh, south of the mall uh, on, one of the, on one of the roads here. Uh, so it was a, a, local, a local startup. And we'll get into who the people behind it uh, were. And by the way, if you ever have a chance to go to the Computer History Museum in Santa Clara or Mountain View, wherever it is, do it. I mean, it's, it's worth the trip because uh, uh, I, I was there. Part of it was closed for renovation, and I was awed. The new exhibits are just, it's nice to walk down memory lane. So do that. Now, my box is somewhere in storage, as best I can tell. It's probably like uh, Indiana Jones where the Ark is off in a warehouse. Uh, I'd be lucky if it's that good. Okay, now the other things we realized, again, it's 1984. Um, PCs, uh, the prior history of all this through teletext, which was a, a TV-based media mostly, uh, was... Uh, custom boxes, so that's kind of where we started. Uh, but we realized the uh, PCs were a phenomenon that wasn't go away. So we created emulators of sorts um, uh, for the Apple II, uh, TRS-80, and IBM PC. And the trouble uh, then in those days, and to degree now, it's not too bad, um, was compatibility. You know, what you can do on an Apple II is not what you can do on a TRS-80 and was really expensive. So the fact we have some homogeny nowadays, although it's slifting apart, uh, is different. Um, okay, and we these things implemented a basic set of uh, NAPLIPS, which was the syntax we used. It was the video text equivalent of HTML, where everything we do now is in HTML. NAPLIPS, which stands for North American Presentation Level Protocol Syntax, is what we used. Uh, sometimes referred to as chicken lips when we were swearing at things. Uh, but we uh, wrote it in Portable C, or attempted to. But there was very little that was portable uh, we could do because of the difference in the hardware for serial input uh, and graphics uh, input. So that was the pain. Um, okay, as we went through, we tried to do uh, main services were banking, uh, uh, tickets and reservation, news, weather, and sports, and uh, our game stranded on Titan. You could see that. Um, now, just to, again, put it in perspective, um, we had Ronald Reagan was president. Uh, ATT was being split up into regional operating companies and all that, which led to this whole telecommunications uh, revolution that got us to where we were, are now, which is great. Uh, we had the famous Mac introduction at the beginning of the year. Uh, I, I put in Mac 128 uh, on there initially because we all, all the geeks there, all looked at it and said, you know, this is pretty nifty, except the next gen of chips is going to be 256 memory chip, so let's take a pass on that. Um, there we had the IBM PCAT coming in. And on the other end of the spectrum, really in the next year, we had the Cray 2. So we're from one end with barely, uh, barely chips to uh, mega flops uh, going on. That was the spectrum. But as you can see out there in the 80s, we had how many 8-bit PCs coming in. So it was really a, uh, I won't say a jungle, but a time of uh, 
uh, survival. Okay, again, a little history. Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones, the Gremlins. Okay, now to put this again in perspective, uh, we're sitting here right across the street was Motorola's world headquarters where they invented cellular communications or did that. Other divisions of Motorola uh, were, did the 6800, which was uh, 6809, I think, was one of the seminal chips. And, of course, the 68000s of its various flavors showed up uh, in all the Macintoshes. I forget which one started the first Mac, but that was it. Hmm? The 68000 straight? Thank you. And that, you know, from then, that was there, and Mo uh, Motorola contributed to that until I think they ran out of steam or IBM uh, made them a better deal with the PowerPC's uh, implementation of RISC. Um, we had, so there was lots of talent in some way here. We had Bell Labs in Naperville down 88 in the corridor where they did a fair amount of Unix development. Um, and that's a whole different talk. Uh, Fermi Labs and Argonne are similarly down there. U.S. Robotics had a plant right off 53. It's now, I think, a Capital One call center. Uh, I, uh, at one time, worked at Digital Equipment, which had offices in Rolling uh, Meadows. Uh, and then we had University of Illinois, uh, both in Urbana in Chicago. And we have the urban legend that the Death Star graphic scene was done at University of Illinois Chicago Circle, which I don't think is an urban legend. I think it's a fact. But... Okay, going back to the key fax services, we also had uh, two local companies of the three partners who were uh, involved in doing that. We had Field Enterprises uh, from the Marshall Field family, uh, the Field Museum, uh, thankful. They owned um, uh, the Chicago Sun-Times. They founded it as a a more liberal competition to the conservative Chicago Tribune. Uh, they also owned uh, a WFLD uh, Channel 32 TV. Um, and WFLD operated at night um, rather than flags waving like a lot of stations. They ran a teletext service. They didn't broadcast it but they used tele, teletext equipment to generate video signals, and they had their news orbiting overnight. Um, and uh, the fun thing is, is I got to be in the same room as Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> Who would have believed? Um, because later he owned the Sun-Times, bought the Sun-Times and WFLD, which he rolled into Fox Enterprises, and installed as the president of Keyfax one of his minions uh, on there. So uh, when he ran through to find out what it was he bought, he had, um, he bought it for the uh, newspaper and the TV and got Keyfax. Um, and so he ran through that, uh, that thing. Um, so uh, the other people were Honeywell Information Services. They're not just thermostats. Uh, they're big into process control and everything, and they had in, uh, have, over time, an initial uh, set of uh, mini computers and mainframes. Back in those days, everybody made computers, okay? Uh, they acquired uh, General Electric, um, which had a large set of mainframes, and Xerox uh, Scientific Data Systems, which was when Xerox was trying to get into the information business, everybody was trying to keep even with uh, IBM. Uh, Xerox bought Scientific Data Systems, which made scientific equipment, roughly equivalent to uh, DEX System 10s. Um, and um, also part of the GE deal, they... Um, you supported Minix or Multics, 
which was a seminal early time sharing multiple service system, uh, which a lot of Unix design was based off the Multic system. It was there. So that's probably why uh, uh, they stayed away from any Unix things. We can get into that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, that, that's uh, one partner. And the other one was Centel, which was a local phone company. They were the ones who were providing your plain old telephone service out in this neck of the woods. And various, they had electric utilities, various uh, operating companies here, and they had uh, headquarters, I forget where it was in here, but we ran our data center into one of their switching offices uh, in Elk Grove Village. Um, and it uh, was a converted uh, mechanical switch building. So you had the room about three times the size of this that had in a wall maybe as big as the back. It was empty where an old mechanical switch was except for a wall full of refrigerator size computers in the back end, which was our data center. Now, in one visit there, uh, I had uh, my, my uh, two young four and six year old boys with me uh, and they just loved running around the big space uh, which was great, and we're doing business. It was more show and tell. I couldn't care what was inside the refrigerators, except one of my kids, I forget which one, had a big wheel that he we whizzed down the floor, and it went underneath the computer and didn't come out the other side. So somewhere in the uh, below the raised floor, somebody found at one time this hot wheel, and I just went, oops, I saw nothing. So uh, that's the fun of bringing your kids, uh, kids to work. Uh, daughters or uh, sons, I kept doing it, but I kept a little better eye on them after that. Um, okay, so what was going on, and this is the same reason there's a lot of the parallels going on. Field uh, Enterprises sees the decline of print news media. They see the electronic delivery as something that can save them money in time. This was their attempt to get on the bandwagon and stay relevant. This is a, still a huge problem that goes on between the news providers and that. The current problems are, well, my chat GPT wants to scrape the uh, New York Times feed and the New York Times costs money, but chat GPT doesn't want to pay. And that's a big drive there. Besides, a lot of the stuff uh, was given away free. Uh, uh, still, I can get, uh, I support uh, uh, some of these news channels, but that's my favor um, on that. So that's still a, a dicey uh, model, business model. Anywhere was pure, pure greed. Uh, they, they wanted to sell more services than hardware. They had a bunch of stuff to sell, and they were doing it, and they were, reason they were buying their, uh, these companies were mostly to buy their customer base. Okay, so they would take uh, scientific data system customers and migrate them to their own systems, or uh, other people. And Centel, wanted to be a player in the deregulated field of uh, communications. They knew things were coming by. They had expertise. Uh, they had local phones that they wanted to migrate. And again, realize at this point a cell phone was a what uh, on here. So that's why the uh, people got together. Uh, um, Fox Enterprises and Rupert Murdoch really ended up not being uh, too enthused about the whole thing. Okay, so what were some of the enabling technologies that were available uh, at that time? Um, we had uh, uh, NAPLIPS, the presentation level protocol that was 
uh, standard uh, uh, presented between Canada and FIP standards. You can download a copy of the standard, and it's good to put you to sleep like most standards are. You read any of the uh, uh, Internet Engineering Committee Task Force, you'll do that. Um, we had uh, uh, Unix-based frame creations uh, systems I can show you there that was presented by AT&T. AT&T was a big pusher domestically uh, for this system. And then you had Scepter, uh, nothing to do with James Bond, but uh, Scepter uh, terminal references. I have no idea what the reference cost, but they were uh, source standard. That uh, would mean if it worked on uh, our stuff, worked presented well on the Scepter terminal, uh, then our terminal better interpret it properly too. Okay, let's see if I can dig out uh, an idea. Now, the, the reason I'm going to play this item um, is because uh, the it gives you an idea of what NAPLIPS was like because it was completely different. Um, now, now, if you notice how that that was how that was drawn um, was by graphical primitive shapes. You know, today on the internet. You know, you have one artist who can do miracle things in Photoshop or your favorite tool. Uh, you maybe compress it one way or another. Uh, you stick it in and it looks photographic. You can do the same thing with video and items there. We didn't have audio. We just had this scheme of uh, graphics. So let me play a little more on here. Uh, let me back on here so we can see how the how images are built up. See, you see the elements being built up individually. Here today, we'll just have a photo. Uh, rendering maybe something done by artificial intelligence, and we would be done. So this is how we did the fa had to do the fancy graphics there. So uh, for our game, which I wish I could do, we had over initially 50 graphics created cartoonish at a time uh, to get this done by uh, people there. Okay, and um, you know, it was a Unix-based system. At that time, the Bell system had no idea what to do uh, with Unix. Uh, they had this give it away to free for universities. We'll charge an arm and a leg uh, for commercial licenses. Uh, I worked for Digital for a while, and Digital was deathly afraid of Unix uh, because AT&T was their best partner. They would not, AT&T out in Naperville would completely clear machines, pull out all the disk packs, clear core, uh, before they let a field technician in to work on a system. Um, so there, you know, it was like, yeah, okay, we'll buy your hardware, but don't you touch Unix. Uh, so that uh, caused some bad blood. I won't say bad blood, but... Um, uh, did that so when it came time for digital to develop VMS, they didn't use C as an implementation. They used another uh, 
I did mostly an assembler in another language called Bliss, which is a whole uh, different talk, which is even more primitive, uh, shoot yourself in the foot than uh, C is. Um, but, you know, VMS is history, so uh, what can you say uh, about that? In Unix, it's history too and lives on with Linux. Okay, so we had uh, parallel efforts. We had Butron, which was trying to do the same sort of thing, mostly out of Miami uh, area, but using pure uh, AT&T equipment. And then we had um, CompuServe, which was beginning to come into the system, but with a whole different uh, idea. They were purely a character-based system, um, and they were trying to sell cycles uh, that they had. Their day job was a successful time-sharing software as a service business, and their nighttime job, they had cycles at night, so they started putting the service together. Uh, and I don't know who here used CompuServe. Yeah, everybody, yeah. Uh, and, uh, then, and then subsequent to that, we had more graphic services with like Prodigy, Prodigy uh, which actually used NAPLIPS, and there's some historical threads I have to take on that. Uh, AOL predecessors that were would take a PC, uh, started at various PCs and do PC-specific implementations, uh, and then eventually AOL. And, of course, my favorite thing were the BBS systems. I spent more cycles downloading floppies and stuff like that than I care to do, but we'll move along here. Okay, so that's kind of the milieu. Now, I was a development manager. Uh, I, had, I had to figure out uh, what to do with this stuff, okay? Now, I come ba uh, came uh, at that time from a interactive uh, area uh, high end communications. I would write communication simulators for remote job entry, all that stuff. So I knew a bit from a bite and sinks, uh, stuff like that. Um, and but nobody, what, what's a video text? I mean, you people are here to try to figure out what it was, and I had the same problem there. Most of the people out there were batch, maybe CICS uh, interactive people. Uh, oriented, time sharing at best. So we had that. Uh, interactive design, you know, now today you have courses in good UE and design. Nobody knew what it looked like then, it was still being invented. We had some examples thanks to Xerox, but most people didn't understand that. Um, and even today, most programmers are visually impaired. Uh, I uh, I, for one, um, know what I like, but I can't create it. You know, this is about as fancy as I can do bullet points on the slide. Uh, here in inserts. Hmm? Oh, okay. Um, and there, and so what I ended up, okay, so we needed, uh, we had people who could write because we could pull in pools from reporters and copy editors from the Sun-Times. Uh, we needed graphics designers, which were still hard and far, far between. So we had a, a talent that pool. And so what we ended up doing was looking for trainability. Uh, we didn't have, you know, we had people we could sit down who would go pick something up and do that. And to a degree, it's pretty much uh, as new talents emerge right now, we're looking for people who can figure out what ChatGPT is, how to use it, and stuff like that. The difference is I can go to Udemy, a whole bunch of online resources, and find courses for people to train that. Those courses didn't exist. They were, uh, you know, line printed manuals uh, at that. Laser printers were just being uh, created there. So. Again, I mentioned we had the frame creation uh, stations, which work pretty much like graphics tablets now. Uh, we had page layout tools uh, that would help 
uh, do things there. They were uh, uh, part of the prime creation. And we had a system called ATEX, which came towards the uh, came out of the newspaper industry that would format uh, things um, easily edit the formatting. Okay, so I don't know if you can read this. How anyway? So this would look uh, very much the way the infrastructure worked. We had the data center. Uh, up in Elk Grove Village, we had a Honeywell mainframe, uh, and we had uh, front-end processors, which are mini, basic, your basic mini-computer. If you look in today's communications processors, your RAID controllers, uh, your Ethernet controllers, all that have their own standalone microprocessor and stuff like that. That's a predecessor back in those days. Those were mini computers that would interface uh, to the more basic equipment on here. And we would have connections to uh, uh, internal uh, connections to uh, the modem bank uh, hosted by in Centel site. And also, uh, we would have a connection to our local cloud here, and we had a front end server there. And these two communicated through X25 packet switch networks. So you would, uh, uh, we would have still be running async, but it would be aggregated, uh, packetized, and send over the network to the front end on the other system there. Similar in many ways that uh, some of the Ethernet is, uh, is, is done there. Uh, we use more Ethernet protocols, but in those days, uh, X25 was it. Later, after this, I used similar arrangement of terminal concentrators. When I supported clients in New York, I would have a series of uh, terminal concentrators on site uh, that would take asynchronous terminals, uh, run through packet switch network, we at least lines to equipment on our data center here in Chicago. It was very effective. Um, but one lesson learned on that, we had redundant data circuits, uh, but there was an outage once, and what we didn't realize is the two different providers leased lines from the same company. So when their line went out, our, both are, so it was like, whoa, whoa what was that? Um, so there, and then locally, and again, the standard communications was uh, async. Uh, on there because uh, Ethernet was just beginning to come out of the labs from Xerox, digital, Xerox, and I forget who the other partner was, was just beginning to get that standard going, and we know the rest is history. Uh, so back then I uh, tripped over async cables and later into fat coax cables and blah, 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 uh, down the line. Okay. So how it was laid out is uh, we had British-based software uh, based on the Teleheis. Uh, we used a process time-shared architecture uh, because really client-server computing was just getting uh, going. Uh, it was written mostly in Fortran because in those days the portable language was Fortran. Um, on there, C hadn't gotten uh, as ubiquitous as that. And the other architecture uh, was is in today's ether, uh, internet, you download an article uh, from the New York Times and it goes on and on and on because you download the whole text-based thing, pictures and all. Back then, because of data size and all that, we broke it up into pages and had to take a long article and have software where we broke up uh, a thousand word articles and a uh, hundred word uh, pages. And one of the things that we had in the standard, which I wish they had into uh, today's HTML or other things is next and back. Because you were reading like in my Kindle, I can go forward and backwards in the book, okay? Today, we just have navigational history. We can go up, 
or cross to what we've seen already, but we can't go to the next logical uh, story on here. Um, okay, and uh, just really, it was Honeywell mainframes, ATEX, we covered some of that, uh, and terminal concentrators. All right, what's next? Okay, we, I showed you the frame creation terminal. Okay, so how does this rack up over time? Uh, we have different tech standards. It was uh, more uh, text graphics like we see in the PCs. We have a very formal uh, structured extensible markup. Uh, as you can see from the graphics, they were all based out of graphics primitives there. Now, because of bandwidth, we have high-res graphics, sound, and video, and it's uh, thanks to the uh, fact I can get a uh, thousand times better performance over the internet, I've got more things to do. Um, and we had a session based. We were a little easier because we knew who was there and what they were doing, so we could keep track of what was up. Now with HTTP, we have session based, sessionless sections, and if we care to keep track of an interaction, we have to send context back and forth and do a lot more Mickey Mouse and dealing with that, which is a complication, but We've all developed all these frameworks that make it mostly harmless. Okay, then we have, you know, communication standards. And the other thing we had real trouble with is uh, dealing with external providers, banks, reservation systems. We had to deal with them directly. They didn't want it set up now. My bank has their internet site, uh, a, you know, uh, United Airlines has theirs. So through the internet, we have a much uh, wider thing and uh, businesses are more accepting there. Talking a bank into going, you want what? You want to make your data available online? So uh, that, that was one of the maturing things that uh, went wrong there. Okay, and just a uh, Brief summary there. I'll I'll give you these slides will be available there. Naplips was text based. Uh, there we don't need to really go through for uh, what they were doing. They were focusing at low, low baud rate applications, and HTTP is what we all know and love. And another question: When was the last time any of you wrote? an actual hunk of HTTP code without using a WYSIWYG or other editor snipping it out of yesterday? You, oh, good. Uh, it's all good, it's glad, it's glad that there are uh, bare HTML people out there still. Um, okay, uh, predecessors, um, I know, how am I doing for time? I'm running a little late. Uh, again, I'll have references to their, uh, Fox had their night owl service, which was text-based, but they did it broadcast. There were services that would uh, broadcast the news over the vertical blanking system, um, and you would have a set-top box and interpret it locally. The Night Owl service, you just saw it on TV, tuned into channel 32, and that's what you saw. You didn't need a text-based box. A lot of the competitors relied on that. Um, there. Um, lesson, context is king. Okay. Um, what, what can you say? We tried to do the best we can. It's still reusable. We use content from the newspapers, periodicals to reduce costs, but there was still the friction of people having to reformat it. We couldn't entirely opti optimize it. Social media is brilliance. I mean, how much money does Google and all, all the social media companies make selling advertising on something they don't, didn't create. Somebody else's 
writing it in, hey, I really liked your trip to Afghanistan or whatever, and that, that goes on, and they collect ad dollars, and there was nothing else to do. So that, that I think, uh, along with selling advertising we can get into there, was part of the brilliance of social media. And uh, stick to the minimum viable product. We might have done better if we didn't sell the moon we concentrated on information, email, and that, the shop, banking, travel, was stuff we wanted to, were aspirations, but could have come down the line. So if we had some simpler systems, did the minimum viable product, we could have gotten some traction uh, on there. Of course, well, search uh, that, um, it really didn't enter the equation at that time. Okay, it cost on some of this. Banks and everybody were hesitant to sign up because of the friction involved. And the cost benefits, we saw it early in there. There was something about, a, a, what, a $5,000? Say our terminals cost, I think, 800 bucks to buy. That only did key facts. No real games and that. For 800 bucks, you could buy whatever, Atari, Commodore, Apple, something like that that had more value uh, to me. I wouldn't see my daughter playing endlessly uh, uh, Oregon Trail um, uh, on a uh, system there. So we tried to cover that with PCs to build on that, which was a later model used by AOL predecessors, uh, and that, which was successful, but we were not quite there. And uh, it was expensive. You had a charge of, you know, uh, phone charges, uh, and uh, it tied up my phone line. Uh, I later, after I left there, I was part of the phone number problem. I had my house line. I had a line for, I had to do uh, nighttime support occasionally. So I had a line for my modem. And I had another line so I could talk to the operator and swear at him or her <laughs> in terms of what was going on. So I had three landlines tied up. That's probably why 708 probably had to go to 847. Um, and, well, here's Midnight Motive Madness. Uh, and here's a uh, quick little stuff. I'm a longtime geek and uh, did stock trading, banking, and all this stuff. And I think I was able to fall into that because I had trading, had experience in communications in real time, and that where a lot of uh, people didn't. Okay, questions? Uh, I will clean this presentation up. Uh, and you can email me there for a copy of that. Uh, but before we go, uh, can I introduce um, a gentleman, Kevin, who uh, coincidentally, uh, I, I saw his name on uh, a bulletin board. He was posting that. Now, uh, come, on, uh, come up, stand up, maybe show your presentation, your item, and... Come on up then. Uh, yes, please. Well, like Art said, I'm kind of astonished that we met each other yesterday. Um, this is an obscure device, no question about it. Um, personally, for one, I am thrilled to hear Art speak about the history of those days, because that was amazing stuff at the time. And I had two connections to this at the time without knowing all this was going on in my backyard. Um, I worked for an ad agency downtown, and one of the things that the Videotech services were trying to do was try to convince advertising agencies to place their clients' ads on these services to thus develop further interest. I was head of research at this agency, and so media research, and so we heard a lot about this kind of stuff, and I was working with um, Keyfax and Viewtron to um, get some ads going, one, one of the clients was Oldsmobile, and somebody had worked up the Oldsmobile logo and we had some pages developed. It never got very far, but that was a, that was a, and I'm just, a, I'm actually absolutely astonished by hearing all this stuff. 
The other side of things is that while working, this is uh, early 80s, and when was Keyfax introduced? 83, 84? Well, 84 was really the yeah. year we went public with it. Yeah, I, I was a, um, although I was in research at an ad agency, I was also on the side a developer. And I had a couple of programs out for the Apple II. And um, when Macintosh came along, I was just dumbfounded by that. And I was absolutely thrilled about that. I was porting stuff to the Macintosh. And one of the things I got fascinated about was Naplips and the whole promise of video techs. Um, and at the time, Macintosh was obviously a low-end player compared to what was going on with the PC world. So there was opportunities for marketplace solutions where there was lots of PC solutions, but no Macintosh solution. So I decided I was going to write a Naplips decoder for Macintosh. And so I actually got fairly well along with it, and I tried to uh, promote it a little bit. I didn't really sell it very hard. I certainly didn't know about what was happening down the street. But uh, so I wound up writing this uh, software um, uh, implementation of Naplips. So thanks, thank Kevin. Yes. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, I was really impressed to see that you, you had uh, your, your software running an emulation on an Apple II, because I know that uh, Prodigy made a pretty concerted effort to get uh, their software, which is also Naplips based, running on Apple II, and they gave up. And I was wondering, like, how much of a subset, like, are we t how much of a small subset were you that you really were able to actually get it working on, on something as small as an Apple II? Well, our... Our, honestly, our PC implementations, because of the problems, even across the board at that point, we kept, tried to keep to a text-based uh, implementation uh, and leave the graphics out because of the compatibility problem. So uh, we had similar pro uh, problems there. We needed, uh, uh, thanks, yeah, feel free to chime in. So we, we were really, uh, I would say, less than satisfactory if we had known uh, at the time uh, that Kevin's effort and other people's effort, we would have done that. But it, it, it was uh, under, P, there was a lack of standards and uh, compatibility. So the predecessors to AOL had like, uh, device specific. Link implementations. Yeah, I know the Quantum Link also, which was one of AOL's predecessors. Right. They and had to fit on a Commodore 64. Yeah, so uh, uh, that was a problem uh, back then. So uh, again, the wonder here is that we were able to all, technology has gotten to a point where we can implement HTML on just about anything. Yeah. Uh, from my Mickey Mouse router to uh, uh, big things. <laughs> And I just, yeah. just wanted to add something about Macintosh, um, that one of the nice things about Macintosh at the time was the implementation of QuickDraw. And there were a lot of primitives on there that really lent themselves to being used in the decoder. Um, uh, one of the other things was uh, Naplips has its own font. And the font is used to create many of the graphics. Many of the many of the, you could do the ge geometric shapes, the vector shapes, but many of the graphics used w this, these weird characters in this font. Well, with the early Macintosh, you could make your own font really easily, character by character. And so the thing that I wrote actually had that. Um, one of the downsides of Macintosh, the early Macintosh, was it was black and white, and so a lot of the Frames, a lot of the uh, graphics oh, yeah. were being created were colored. So there's a whole process of like, how do you choose appropriate black and white shading and hatching and so on to, to look like colors without the whole thing being a mess. Right. And, and you, you can see that, you know, the Macintosh, a workable Macintosh was the 512 one. Uh, and that was later in the game. So that predated our ability. The only one we might have had a chance to do was the IBM PC with the CGA card. And I think one of the talks yesterday was about Marty PC, where he's talking about the uh, emulation of the CGA cards and the wonders there. So that would have been a path to go, but you know, at that point we were using multi-plan trying to figure out our next swivel. So uh, that's it. Any other? Uh, uh. 
Hi. So um, I just wanted to ask about like key facts. I had the impression that it was connected in some way to Night Owl, like Ooh. in terms of being uh, for some reason, I thought key facts came over the air like Night Owl did which not quite apparently uh was there any relation aside from the similarity in name to like bbc's cfax or uh, not with just... cfax they're again they're just close to be different uh it was the same philosophy but uh technically the uh the parent company cfax was uh uh keycom electronic publishing oh. okay which was the part of field enterprises that also did the Night Owl, which wasn't over the air, but used over the air teletext pro, uh, prototypes. They never uh, got into set top boxes or anything along those I see, lines. I see. Thank you. Um, so, my question is just like since you had like such a limitation on like um, actual transmission of your services. What would have like um, compression looked like for that kind of thing? Since we have like you know PNG and stuff like that for no, modern stuff. Um, uh, the compression was just bit efficient coding. Okay, so uh, rather than uh, things like JPEG or uh, uh, at, you know SVG, the it was just uh, a tight encoding, similar to uh, you know the way uh, like ARM instruction sets are compact, byte efficient in terms of that, um, as opposed to things like x86, which are bits, 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 bits cool. and that. So the focus on the spec was uh, uh, just, uh, you know, two or three bytes for an X coordinate, this and that, um, it, compared to uh, uh, HTML, you'll have, yeah, you know, this is something, a whole bunch of text that needs interpreting uh, and the end of something. So it was, you know, XML and uh, HTML are all very verbose. Yes. Yeah. So it was compressed in the sense like binary, uh, maybe binary HTML. Cool. Thanks. On that. Okay. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Much appreciate your feedback. <laughs>